Welcome to the Free Will Science and Religion Podcast. I'm Trick Slattery. I'm here with George Ortega, David Joseph, Gary Moser, and Chandler Klebs. George, take it away. All right. Basically, in this episode, we're going to um, explore why all our decisions are made at the level of the unconscious and what the relationship is uh, between consciousness, unconscious, and our, our, our will, what we do, why we do what we do. So basically, David, um, the, the, um, the hypothesis, the, the thesis that we're exploring is like, by my understanding, if, if all the data by which we decide is in our unconscious, and it has to be because our, our consciousness is only an awareness mechanism, it's not a data storage mechanism, and if all the principles, like our moral values, our reason, our, you know, the, the, the principles by which we decide is also in our unconscious. Because, again, like when we're deciding, like, whether to have a, um, you know, whether to go one place on vacation, another place on vacation, whatever, we don't go through, we don't know all this stuff. We just, like, this, this, this decision comes to us. So if the principles and the data are stored in the unconscious, that seems to mean that all our decisions are actually made in the unconscious, and then we become aware of them, you know, at our, our unconscious makes us aware of what it's decided. So, and that's what makes free will impossible. So, David, how does that sound so far? Um, does it sound reasonable? Uh, yeah, that sounds reasonable. But, um, I'll ask something along the lines of, uh, when do we first become conscious? Or when okay. we first experience consciousness. Yeah. Oh, excellent. All right. So that's, I, I think that's prenatal, you know, like my understanding, yeah. like through sonograms and all, you, you have like infants smiling, infants responding to the, the voice of their, their parents and all, responding to music. Right, right. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'll chime in. Uh, you know, I think it's exactly the opposite is that, you know, those are just reflexes, you know, so there is no true sensation because the brain hasn't developed at all, really, in an infant. You know, their brain doesn't even tie to get The two halves of your brain aren't even communicating until you're, like, one year old or something. So I don't think it's likely that there's a lot of consciousness going on. There's just the development of reflexive reactions. You know, some of the muscle memory is being created so the baby has some reactions when it's born that the mother can recognize. You know, if the baby didn't do anything, if it just sat there like it was dead, you know, the mother would just throw it in the garbage. So the baby has to have some actions built in, and those are just the creation of those... Um, reflexes that'll uh, that'll stimulate the mother to take care of it. Yeah, right, they also go ahead, Rick. Uh, they also say that that uh, like a fetus has uh, all these chemicals um, that do, do, don't come out until after birth. Uh, that pretty much make the fetus almost uh, um, as uh, ah, what's the word aesthetic. Anesthetized. 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 Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Gary. I could not get the word out, but but. For the, for the most part, um, it, it doesn't really experience too much in there. So, so wait a minute. Are we saying that like the the, the infant isn't really quote unquote conscious until what you say like a, a year or so after? It's uh, yeah. Well, see, that, see, it goes back to like I think the evolutionary origins of, of consciousness and all that stuff. I mean, this really is a mechanism for learning. You you know, value integration. You know, putting value into our experience through sensation only has real value in the sense that now you can learn strategies. So you can learn to change your behavior based on your personal experience. So previous animals just hatched into the world and they had automatic programming and they never learned anything. But with consciousness, now you can learn and by valuing experiences and now your memories have values tied to them. And so that's really what's going on. So that's a much more complex kind of thing. So a baby doesn't have much to learn because a baby's just a, you know, I need to get my basic wheels on the ground kind of thing. So especially human babies, you just compare them to like a gazelle or something that's born and it has to start running right away. It starts to have to be a con it has to be alive much sooner than a human baby. So there's no real advantage for a baby to do any uh, sensation learning because its environment is too confused. You know, gravity's screwed up. That it's never in a you know what I mean. It's not in a walking position. It senses so it's it's just not a it's not rational for it to be consciousness to be conscious. And I think the fact that it, that it wouldn't serve any logical purpose means it probably doesn't exist. All right, well, here's where. Go ahead, Chandler. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, I'm going to have to disagree with these other dudes here um, who think <laughs> these babies aren't conscious, you know, because how, what do I you think babies are conscious, Chandler, just so you know. 
Yeah, well, here, what I'm, but here's the deal. I know that you don't think like they're a baby until after they're born or something, um, something like that. Um, but anyways, what good would a feeling do? A, what, what, what good would a feeling do a plant, right? A plant can't get up, can't walk away, can't run away, can't do anything. So what good would a feeling do it? What good would a feeling do a baby? It can't do a darn thing about it. <laughs> well, first, first of all, um, it, here, here's the thing is whether, whether, whether it does any good or not is beside the point here. What, what do you do about when the babies uh, move in response to music? They hear music when they're in the womb and react to that. You know, like I, I think this I is understand, but, but if I, you want to talk about reflexes, I'll talk about how much an insect moves and then you'll have to explain how it's having a horrible experience and then we'll have to end all life on earth right now because it's a terrible holocaust. So I'm just saying if you want to give a baby feelings, you're going to have to give insects feelings. Yeah, well, but I, wait a minute. I, I, do, I do think insects have feelings. Well then, how do you how are you accepting life on Earth then? Okay, because it's a you know if if a metamorphosis is a conscious experience, if a, if a caterpillar is feeling the process of having all its organs removed and reoriented, okay, it's it makes the Holocaust, it makes every single human misery seem so trivial by comparison. Because then every day, sentient organisms are being thrown in a mangala torture chamber. Um, and we really don't have any reason to ever smile again in our ever in our existence. Just <laughs> contemplate how much torture is going on on planet Earth. Let me explore this. Let me explore this, from, let me explore this from a behaviorist. Let me explore this from a behaviorist pr perspective. In other words, like we can't assign feelings to an ant because we can't perceive the ant, you know, expressing what we would recognize as feelings. But but with an infant, you know, an infant will cry, an infant will laugh, an infant will have these answer. emotions. Oh, come, come on. I mean, that's just so, you're telling me an ant doesn't do things a lot more complicated than an infant. It does things in tremendously more complicated and has to feel, it's sensing its environment all the time. If you say it doesn't feel anything associated with those senses, I just say, well, how do you, what evidence do you have of that? No, no, like, I'm, I'm, Gary, what I'm saying, it's, this is, again, <laughs> from a behavior's perspective. In other words, like, we can't definitively say that an ant has feelings because we can't perceive them. I mean, we might actually... No, I actually... Say we can logically deduce their existence, so yeah. I'm saying that I don't, I don't buy that argument. I'm just saying fetuses are, are losers just because fetuses are essentially plants. If they had physical acuity, if they had something they could actually do, then you could say, okay, maybe there's a reason to have feelings and there's a reason to start learning. But there's no point in it. They're just learning yeah. gravity. They're learning basic things Even, that feelings well, would give no advantage. <laughs> There's a lot of feelings that we have that have no function or purpose, so I don't think that that matters yeah, I think, very much. Okay, I'll, just go, I'll, go to the, I'll go to the intuitive reason why, is that I personally wasn't conscious as an infant, okay? I don't have any memories, I don't have any anything from all that period, so I'm just going to say, intuitively, I have that evidence, which is I didn't become conscious until I could walk. I was standing up. My first conscious moment took place when I was standing up. That I remember. Well, well I mean, that's just memory, because right? you don't that's, remember yeah. something does not at all mean that you weren't conscious Well, I, I think it time. does. I think that's the whole point of feelings is to remember them. I think the whole point you have them is to create a, a whip and a punishment, a reward and a punishment, and that's exactly why they exist. And so if you're not going to remember them, there will be no point in having them. Well, here's well, the deal. I don't, I don't remember what I ate, ate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner the past month every day. Like, seriously, there's no way. So like, but at the time it served a function to be conscious, but then afterwards that memory is useless, so it's thrown out pretty much. All right, guys, this is interesting, but this is a bit yeah. apart from this whole free will thing. <laughs> so, um, David, um, how does it sound so far in terms of like, you know, like the unconscious consciousness and free will? Um, I'm still kind of coming to grips with it, to be honest with you. Okay, uh, all right. Let let let's pause. Let's pause it again. So, um, basically. And again, one of the problems we're having, David, is that, like, for example, like, I, I researched this, there's about 20 different definitions of consciousness, there's about right. six or seven different definitions of the unconscious. So, like, right, but, right. but when I was doing this research, one thing I discovered is, like, in terms of consciousness, there's one definition that, that pretty much is the most basic, the most general, the, the one that's most universally understood is that consciousness, exactly, Exactly. Right. Consciousness is awareness. So in other words, like consciousness is not a data storage mechanism. Consciousness is not a data processing mechanism. Right? So if we see consciousness just as awareness, just then the logic tells you that if consciousness is just awareness, 
the, the processing and the memory both have to be done at the level of the unconscious. Well, it's all right. synthesized, though. The awareness is all synthetic, so it's all an illusion created inside your brain. So I'm not going to, you know, I, I, awareness is a tricky word for me to use just because, I, I, you know, it's all synthetic. We're all living in a fake world created in our mental construct, and it's an interpretation of reality. It isn't reality that we feel. If I, if I have a sensation of hot, my brain has created that sensation. It has nothing to do with heat. It has nothing to do with fire. It has nothing. That thing itself didn't shoot sensation into me. My brain constructed it's, sensation it's based, a, on the, based on this, the, based on what sensors were hit. So it's a kind of radar, and the radar can be, you know, sonar. The radar can be, you know, all kinds of different kinds of signal transmission. But our brain creates the illusion, and I'd say the real key ingredient is feelings. If you don't have feelings, in my opinion, you're not conscious. Well, right. Consciousness well, is an output of brain configurations, basically. So, so you have the brain configuration, and it outputs conscious experience. That doesn't mean consciousness doesn't exist. For it exists as a brain configuration, basically. Right, but, but yeah, again, let's say it is all an illusion. I'm just saying that consciousness isn't a, a material um, uh, a phenomena, ether or something. Yeah, it's just a relationship inside of a brain. A brain I, has constructed the theater. The theater exists nowhere but in your brain. I consider it a property of the brain, uh, just like roundness is a property of a ball or, or uh you know, slipperiness is a property of ice. So, well, I, a, I'll just make say I use my metaphor again. It's a mixing bowl that doesn't exist anywhere but in your brain. All right, again, let's back to the free will thing. Chandler, explain, you know, relatively concisely why um, our decisions are made at the level of the unconscious and not consciously. Well, quite simply, because we're not always aware of them. And so we know that the unconscious, by definition, is something we're not conscious of. We're not aware. And so you look, look at everything you do. If you watch yourself and think, well, why did I go walk right at, or left here? And like, if there's more than one um, way to get to the same place, and sometimes you're doing it one way and sometimes you're doing the other, but you're not aware of why you supposedly decided to walk one way than another or you know you're not aware of it you and now if you look into it and you look at the the prior causes you might still be able to figure out why you did it and sometimes right. well, you'll be we, right we, sometimes you'll be wrong we, but you're we, not we, always we aware saying, we, excellent we, point Chandler. we keep saying the word you and i think that's where the conversation that's where our vocabulary is fundamentally broken there is no you program you just happens to be what programs running at a particular time so yes a program in your brain can allow you access to the footprints of your decision and you can see where you came from and you can see where you're going because your brain says now be aware of that but that's like your brain deciding what to focus on in an image right i mean i, I my eyes go places i don't consciously tell my eyes where to go my eyes are already going there and i just follow along so in a sense it's there's no you that decides anything there's a program running in your brain that says, hey, why did I do that? But yeah, you didn't yeah. I agree with you, Gary. See, I agree with you on the fundamental understanding of the illusion of the self and all that. How, and I agree that our language is broken. I mean, the English language is an epic fail. Um, but here's the deal. We're trying to dumb this down so that everybody you know, can understand this because this is kind of deep. You know, we want first-time listeners to be able to truly understand. So we talk in terms of you and I and, and self and that sort of thing, um, you know, because it's helpful. Because it's it, – you. Ha this is a slow progression. You know what I'm saying? You, you don't just – you don't just start out, um, you know, in being an average citizen, not knowing anything about the subject, and then all of a sudden going to being realizing that you are uh, that you're uh, you are basically nothing more than a consciousness watching a movie in a in a sense. Yeah, well, I think we'll describe it in enough ways that um, you know, for everybody's own level of comprehension, they'll find a metaphor or analogy that makes it make sense to them. So I'm just saying, like, I, I could use a term like my brain. As a, as a replacement for I, you, all that kind of stuff. I could just say your brain, or I could say my brain decided. Now, yeah. that's more literally true, and I'm just saying it gives more of an idea that, yes, it's one of the programs running in my brain that did right. this thing. And, and, I 
you know, it brain yeah. did. Yeah, and here's, the, and here's the thing to understand, this, this where we have this self-illusion and we say things that, that it's me and that this is mine, you know, my brain, my belly button, you know. Like, here's the deal. We say this stuff, but it's the understanding that, like, I, like, the way I look at it is none of us really owns anything. Nothing really belongs to anyone else. Well, I know, but there's no point in taking, there's no point in not denying our, our different identities. So I, I don't think right. there's anything saying right. my brain my right. it is my brain like, it's this yes. scary brain yes. do i have to say scary brain i mean i'm just saying why do i have to parse it that small i'm just i'm saying i am not an i right. i'm a brain okay right. so i think that's an important <laughs> distinction yeah and i don't it, think it's something to, to dis dismiss it's an important distinction recognizing the difference between an i and a brain yeah, yeah i agree but here's here's the thing a brain oh, does thinking, an eye doesn't do anything. Right, but relative, relative, relative to this, like, you know, theme of free will, in other words, like, one of the ways we try to explain that we don't have a free will is because, like, if we did have a free will, we'd all, for example, be blissed out every moment of every day. We're, we're hedonic creatures, we seek pleasure, avoid pain, but then if, like, if we're hedonic creatures, you know, in other words, like, if, if, I I want to feel pleasure every moment of every day. So this is this is an I, right? But that's not the only part of me. There's like the I that I feel that's like my desires. Then there's a part of me that actually, you know, the the part of me that like this stream of of, of consciousness that isn't also always complete bliss. So we have to dis distinguish between the I that represents our let's say our ideal will or what we would will if we would have a free will, and then the part of our brain that is the I that's actually what's act what's actually happening regardless of what we want to happen. Well, right. You have the desire to be at the top of the stairs, and then you have to have the will to climb the stairs. So, I mean, you have to have these. You have to have the 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 knowledge to know you have to actually go up each stair to get to the top of the stairs. You can't just magically pop to the top of the stairs. So, yeah. you, you you can want to win the chess match, but but to win it, you actually don't have to know how to play chess. You can't just say I won. You know, yeah. you actually have to do the process of life, and that's right. the knowledge that controls you. So, you're always but, going to be controlled by. Yeah what you know about how to play the game. So you have right. to know how to play the game to play the game. And using terms of the self is really a pragmatic thing. It's a practical limitation of our language because I would say that, you know, I am Chandler instead of saying we are the living cells that make up Chandler consciousness. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> well, I know, but I, I'd say, that, see, I, I, you're still going, you're jumping over what I think is an important distinction, which is I think it's okay to say you are, I don't care about the living cell part, to understand, though, that you are programs. You are, my brain of 100 billion neurons right. is doing something. It's not just sitting there, you know, whatever, planting tulips or something. It's actually, <laughs> all those neurons are making me so that's how I did right. what I do, is yes. because I have a brain that does it. I don't do it. I don't sit there and ride on it. Okay? Yeah. Brain does it. Brain right. makes And me. that's what I'm saying. It's a practical thing. So it's totally okay to use terms of you or I, you know, my brain. Yeah. It's totally okay to do that because that's how we have to talk to people. That's the only way we can, because otherwise they're going to wonder what we're talking about. <laughs> well, I just think that, Bill, it is dangerous. I'm just saying that I would like to migrate, once we get people comfortable with the ideas, to migrate language into something that gets those words out of language. Because I think just in our own conversation with each other, as soon as we start saying, I decided to just look in my past and see why I did something, you know, it just sounds like, oh, that sounds like you're free willing again. You yes. decided. I mean, who's this you character who decided? Yeah. And here and George, I want to I want to continue what I was saying, though, about the unconscious. The whole purpose of self-reflection and looking at your behavior at, at like and recording yourself talking and then listening to yourself talk. And you think, well, why did I say that? The whole purpose of going into that and looking at yourself, analyzing your behavior is to try to figure out why you did what you did. And the reason you have to try to figure out why you did what you did is just because you don't know why you did what you did. Excellent. Exactly. So, so look at it as if, <laughs> as if you're a store and that's the efficiency officer, right? So you have a program, one of your programs, you know, your programs are the food program and the you know love program and all these different programs and one of your programs is the efficiency officer who's saying 
you know, you've got to maximize your performance, buddy. Uh, you know, you're, you're wasting a lot of space and time. And so that's one of the programs you have that runs that says we got to reorder your priorities so you're a little more functional because you showed up for work, you know, 10 minutes late. So you got to quit doing that, buddy. Okay, Trick, for the benefit of our audience, take us back to square one. Explain why our decisions are not freely willed while they're, why they're taking place at the level of the unconscious. Because they causally happen, and to causally happen, they can't causally be conscious first. They have to come through processes that aren't conscious to lead to the consciousness. Uh, and this, this can be shown from experiments, uh, recent experiments uh, from Nature Neuroscience, which are um, an updated version of the Labette experiments, is where basically they have a person pressing either a button with their left or right hand, uh, and they tell the person to look at a clock and decide when they decide to press the right or left hand, whatever one they, they decide on. And using um, MRIs, they can determine that the person will press the right button or the left button uh, with fairly good accuracy. I mean, not 100% not accuracy, but very good accuracy before they even are consciously aware of the decision they make. So, so they're looking at the neural scans, and they, they can see the areas of the brain light up for left hand or right hand before the person even is consciously aware that they have decided to press the well, right that, that's another that, that sort of gets back to the error checking, too, because I'd almost say that the reason why we've made the decision before we even act is because the brain is looking for an excuse not to. So it sets up a, this is my preferential response. So it has a first response and says, yes, let's go right. And then it looks for a reason not to. You, you know, your brain takes some time and says, right. let's analyze this to make sure it's the right decision. And it only changes the decision if there's some reason to change it. So it makes a decision and then it looks for a reason to change it. If there's no reason to change it, it goes with it. Right. And the, and the important part of it is it all happens before the person is consciously aware of button that they're going to press so before they decide, oh, I'm going to press button. The well, right well, that's, that's button. the catch, right? Because that's another one of these consciousness issues that we're not really conscious of when we, like if you really think about when you do something, you don't really consciously do it, right? It just kind of like you just slide into it, right? Like it's like jumping into a pool of cold water. You're sitting there and you're just saying, waiting for your consciousness to say jump. And, and then all of a sudden you just do it, right? And you don't it's like you don't know what actually made you do it because it just seems like all of a sudden it happened. And it's like when you write your name or do anything, you don't like make it happen. You just kind of have the idea that you're going to do it and then it starts, you know, but there's no conscious connection to exactly how it starts. You're not, you're, it's completely invisible to you, the exact mechanism that started your foot walking. I think of our brains as kind of like our intestines, <laughs> and I hope this isn't too gross to you guys, but like I think about it, well, realizing that I'm not conscious of how my food's digesting and passing through my intestines, but um, at a certain point, I become aware that I have to use the bathroom. <laughs> You know, that's the consciousness, how the unconscious process of the intestines uh, go to the consciousness. Yeah, well, it is sort of just an excretion, so you could use that word. Our brain just excretes the activity, and, uh, you know, again, I would just say that the consciousness is a superfluous uh, attachment. You know, it's a necessary bowl part. It's a reflector. It's a mirror, but it isn't really an active player. It's just an active watcher. Okay, right. David, do you, do you get that, or do you, do, does it seem to you still that, like, our consciousness, you know, uh, plays a necessary part in our decision making. Um, no, I think I understand it. I think I'm, I'm kind of getting there slowly but surely. Excellent. Yeah. Another way, for example, let's say somebody asks you, like, whether you, do you want, like, you know, he's got an apple and a pear. And, you know, like, do you want an apple or a pear? And like, don't we just like wait for the answer to come to us? You know, like, oh, you know, oh, I want an apple. And then, as Chandler was saying, like, why do we want it? Maybe we had a pear yesterday, right? And maybe we not, may not even be we remember that or whatever. So basically, like what what um, Sam Harris also like described to us in, in his book uh, Free Will, it's like these thoughts just come. What we're saying now, the next thing you're going to say, the next thing the next person is going to say, they just come to us. This stuff just comes to us, and as Gary was saying, we just become aware of it as we're saying it. We're not aware of what we're going to say and how we're going to say it until we say it. 
Uh, here's here's another kind of modern analogy. It's like your brain says, Google it, okay? And it takes it a minute to Google it, right? So the concept comes in and it says, Google it, you know, find out, find out about that, whether I can trust that guy. Do I trust Pierce or do I trust Apples? Who's more honest? And so your brain basically Googles the question and it comes up with the, you know, the predominance of the answer is, okay, okay, Apple today, Apple, 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 Apple wins. Right. Yeah. And, and the key to that, Gary, is that like, you know, as it's searching, again, consciousness is not a data storage mechanism. It's an awareness mechanism. So because the data of like, you know, apples and, and pears and, and why we might want with the other is all stored in the level of the unconscious, that's why the, the decision has to be made by the unconscious. Yeah, it's just all an algorithm. You know, you all, based on your life experience, there's a net product that comes out. You know that says this this wins. This has more, you know, five star ratings, and then the other one's a four and a half star. So, yep, the five star guy wins. All right. So now, Trick, explain to us what what is the purpose of consciousness? If if four of our decisions are pretty much being made at the level of the unconscious, you know, why do we need consciousness? See, this is where I think we might disagree a little bit because I think consciousness does play into the whole causality of the situation. So, so the fact that our unconsciousness leads to a conscious state, that conscious state plays back downward and downward causally into our conscious, our next conscious or subconscious state. So, uh, so. Um, all right, well, let's, Trick, let's, let's say hold on, hold on, Trick, Gary. Let's say I accept that, right? So, like yes. you're saying, like the the unconscious. You know, leads to conscious activity that loops back to the unconscious. But wouldn't Correct. we wouldn't we agree that that conscious part, you know, is under the direct control yes. of the unconscious? Yes, exactly. It's, okay, it's under, the, it's under the direct control of the un, of the subconscious. So the subconscious leads to the conscious, which affects the configuration of your brain, which is subconscious, which leads to the next output. So so. So, for example, uh, Chandler brought up having to go to the bathroom. Uh, it's the pressure or whatever, and then, and then you feel the discomfort, which is the conscious part of all this subconscious processes, which lead to the next part of you going to the, well, you know, well, the, well, the, the subconscious that leads to you going to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me give you an analogy. So, so if I have a, a movie screen, right, and the screen is blank, okay, and now I shine a movie on it, okay, and... And the movie bounces off and reflects off a mirror and then shines back on the same screen, right? So you have a t uh, two, two images on the screen, right? I have my first image and then my second image. And I could say those are the subconscious. So the movie is the subconscious. Mm -hmm. And I would say the consciousness is just the screen. So explain to me what the screen does besides just reflect what the subconscious is doing. It's all subconscious product. That's it's a good question. Bouncing off the screen. So in my opinion, this, you can't really call the screen a player. It's necessary. You're not going to see the movie without it. But the screen doesn't add anything. It just reflects what the subconscious throws at it. But the subconscious gets configuration, gets configured based on that screen. Well, I know, but it's doing it through the same senses. It's sensing reality. So you sense your feelings with the same senses you're sensing reality with, okay? So your feelings are just being added, just like another image on the screen. So your brain creates a sensation. It creates a reaction to the sensation. Your, your subconscious does all of this work. And I, well, I'm still just going to argue that the consciousness doesn't have any neural networking right, we've got it's, about a minute a and a half product. left so like let me like just a uh, trick i think what gary is saying is like for example the um what what we're conscious of the unconscious is also conscious of in other words in priming experiments you know we um are, are actually our unconscious is is conscious of things that are, we're not conscious of so i think basically like if our unconscious is also conscious of what we're conscious of then the question becomes why would we require this this extra element of consciousness i'm saying i'm saying without the conscious our subconscious would be entirely different than it is in other words it, it would be configured differently it wouldn't it wouldn't configure the same way as if well, it I'm has saying the, the mirror is necessary to the function of the tool, but I'm just saying the mirror is not doing anything. The mirror is just reflecting. So I'm still going to argue that, yes, the consciousness necessity is just a mirror, though. It's not. It's it's necessary to the experiment, but it's not. It's not doing anything in the experiment. 
All right, we're, we've got about half a minute left. I think we are agreeing. Like So, again, we have a, a bit of disagreement whether the consciousness is actually necessary to the decision-making or not, and we'll continue to talk about that. But basically, I think we have agreement that whether it is or not, you know, it is controlled by the unconscious, and that's what makes free will impossible. Okay, this is George Ortega with Gary Mosher, David, <laughs> brain, Joseph. Brain. Brain, brain, brain. Right, we'll see you next time. <laughs>